a world-renowned psychologist, Dr. Eric Fromm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lorden. Uh, speaking about the spiritual problems of affluence, we have to remind ourselves first that really we are not quite as affluent as we believe to be. The fact is that about a uh, little over 40% of the American population has an income uh, uh, not higher than $3,000 a year per person or $6,000 per year uh, per family. Well, that of course is affluent. If we uh, compare our situation with that of India, uh, we have about 30 times in per capita income of India and about um, eight times the per capita, in, uh, per capita income of Mexico. But nevertheless, uh, we are not quite so affluent, but there's every reason to believe, unless we blow ourselves to pieces by nuclear war in the next few years, that we shall be, in a few generations, a truly affluent society. And then you might ask, are there any problems? Uh, isn't that all we want? Are we not on the way to it? And what about the spiritual problems of affluence? The more, the better and uh, we are happy. Well, uh, that affluence is a good thing uh, in the sense that it affords every man to have the material basis for a dignified life and for enjoying what we call culture that uh, we are all agreed on and uh, there's no need to use time to talk about that. But what I shall talk about is the problems of affluence, the dangers of affluence and the dangers precisely which we are confronted with. And I want to make it very clear at the beginning, I'm not talking against affluence. I'm talking against a certain attitude which affluence is creating and a new type of man which comes into existence uh, in this 20th century. <coughs> I should like to define this new type of man in three different ways. First of all, I should like if you don't mind to call him by a Latin name, the homo consumens, <laughs> the consumer man, the man who is voracious, the eternal suckling, the man who has constantly to fill himself with something, with something he can drink in. It doesn't matter what it is. It consumes uh, cigarettes and liquor and sex and television and lectures and books. <laughs> He is always passive, taking it in and uh, rarely digesting it. Uh, the best uh, example is really television, where you are glued to the thing and you know that voracious feeling. You are taking something in and yet you are inwardly lazy. That's why some of us feel badly after having listened to something for an hour, seen something on the screen for an hour. Uh, now, uh, what I'm saying is that this new consumer man is essentially passive. Now, this is a matter of terminology. I use passive here in the sense in which it has been used by Spinoza. Namely, not in the sense of not doing something. We are doing something all the time. In fact, we can't stand not doing something. We get very nervous and tense if we don't do something. But what I mean by passive is passivity in Spinoza's sense. That of an inner passivity. Uh, or to use a Freudian term, if you don't mind, of being receptive, uh, constantly taking in something without an inner act of productivity. Perhaps you can see the difference if I give one example. Try to remember a person's face whom you know and to create the image of this face in your mental eye. Now you will find sometimes, even if the person is well known to you, that you have difficulties in fully seeing his face. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. You find it difficult, you have to produce something in yourself. Uh, but if and when you do, because becoming aware of oneself, observing oneself, is something which interrupts the usual rhythm of always being busy. Uh, now actually, behind this front of the homo consumens, of the 
consumer is a man who is anxious, alone, frightened, and somewhat depressed. The poet Auden called our age the age of anxiety, and I think he was right. Now you may ask, well, but how can people who feel so satisfied, so thrilled, so uh, uh, excited all the time, how could one say about them that they are lonely, unhappy? Is there such a thing as unconscious unhappiness, unconscious loneliness, unconscious depression? Well, I'm afraid you will think I'm talking like a psychoanalyst who sees uh, uh, the skeleton of the unconscious always in the closet. But uh, uh, in spite of my being a psychoanalyst, I think essentially this is a truth. This is a fact that we can be unconsciously bored, unconsciously depressed, unconsciously anxious. Let me give you one example where you can observe maybe some of you have, this unconscious anxiety or depression behind what I call the voracious attitude. And that is in the cases of overeating or overbuying. You find often, in fact usually, that people who are compulsive eaters, and that if God doesn't give them the favor of remaining slim in spite of the eating leads often to obesity, that such people are motivated and you find in them at close examination anxiety and depression. That's just a fact. If you ask them, however, do you feel anxious and depressed, they say, no, all I want is to eat and when I eat I feel fine. <laughs> now you find the same thing with alcoholics, you find the same thing with drug addicts, and the psychology of it is that the depressed or bored person senses an inner vacuity, senses that he feels nothing, senses that he is not really related to the world. And the way to compensate for that is to taking something in, to fill himself with something. It doesn't matter what it is. The strange thing about this voracity is that it isn't really the drink, the food, the thing you buy. It is almost, you could describe, a sense of inner em emptiness which you want to fill up so that you don't feel empty and that means that you don't feel depressed. One word here about depression for those who are not familiar with any psychological literature, some people think depression is to be sad. Uh, depression is not to be sad. Depression is to feel nothing. And uh, paradoxically enough, a, sa a depressed person would feel happy if he could be sad. Because sad is a feeling. The depressed feeling is that of feeling nothing. And I would say one word about something which I've mentioned before, namely boredom. Boredom is a much more severe state of mind than most of us uh, believe. And actually, I would define boredom as a slight chronic depression which, however, can be cured by fun. Uh, and we have a whole industry which is boredom preventing and sells its good to make us not aware of our boredom. Because if we are aware of our boredom, then this is rather uh, uh, most unpleasant, to say the least, state. Maybe you remember, uh, some of you, who go to cocktail parties, uh, uh, you stand around for half an hour, you talk about nothing, your hostess drags you from one person to the other, you smile for half an hour until your face hurts. Uh, you are not aware, however, of being bored, except when you leave, your face sags, you look sad, you are bored, and when you come home and your children ask you how was it, and you say, oh, it was wonderful. Then your children are somewhat startled by the fact that you're so tired and that you look so exhausted. Well, in all this process you were not aware of being bored, except your face shows it, your tiredness shows it, that you were. Uh, and you might take any conversation. Uh, you might uh, think that's just fine, except you notice that after half an hour you're terribly sleepy and you think you haven't slept enough or you take some pep pills because you think there's something wrong with your organism. The fact is, nothing happened in that conversation. You were not really communicated. Neither were you listening, nor was the other person listening. You were just exchanging records. 
Now, <clears throat> this is one uh, aspect of the pathology of the modern, the modern man is being the consumer. The second aspect is one which is even perhaps more dangerous, and that is the modern man is a gadget man. Now I would, or if you would like a Latin name, I would say the homo technicus, not the homo faber, but not the, cr not the constructing man, but the technical man. And in this law for gadgets, the, or this law for gadgets, I would describe as an attraction to that which is not alive as against the attraction to that which is alive. Uh, let me give two examples. There was a, a cartoon some time ago in the New Yorker where a young girl tries to buy a perfume and the sales girl says to her, I can recommend this to you. It's very attractive. It smells like a sports car. <laughs> now, that was very uh, much to the point. I think there are today plenty of men who are more interested in sports cars than in girls. Now, uh, that may sound more moral because you can't do any act of mor immorality with a sports car. <laughs> I think it's profoundly immoral because it's a preference to that which is not alive to that which is alive. And I think as long as one is geared to life, there is no true immorality. If one becomes geared to that which is not alive, there is a serious danger of immorality in a profound sense of the word. Or take hi-fi. You find, hi find hi-fi uh, uh, fans who, uh, uh, let us say, play Bach, and they think they play Bach, and they listen to Bach, and enjoy Bach. But what they're really doing is, they wait for that very deep sound which only their hi-fi can produce. <laughs> so they wait for that, wait for 10 minutes, there it is, they are happy, and then they go on, that's not so interesting anymore. Yet consciously, they tell themselves, their wives and their friends, they enjoyed the Bach piece so much. Now, this is the gadgeteer. This is the person who becomes attracted to that which is not alive. I don't have the time to go into this any further, so you won't mind if I mention my latest book, which is just published, The Heart of Man, in which I try to describe how this love for the non-organic, for the gadget, is connected with something in more severe forms which is much more dangerous, namely an, an attraction to all that is dead, all that is decaying, all that is not alive, all that is destroyed. And indeed, you can see people, and sometimes you can see it in their faces, who love life, and you can see people who love death who love that which is unalive. They have a peculiarly dead expression in their face. Uh, sometimes they hide it by a smile if they are aware of it. I mean, if they want to appear as uh, in a certain role. But if they are not aware of it, then you see their voice, their face, everything is dead. Well, others who are also have an affinity for death and that which is not alive seem to like it. Some people don't. Now the third element, the third factor in what I call here the man of the affluent society in its negative aspect is the alienated man. You know that the word alienation is used, uh, was used by Hegel and then by Marx, uh, by many theologians. I don't have the time to go into it, but let me define it briefly. By alienation one means that man ceases to feel himself as a living subject of his acts, but that he becomes dominated and ruled by the works of his own hands and by the circumstances he creates. <clears throat> the prophets of the Old Testament called it idolatry, which meant not the problem of worshipping several gods instead of one, that's quite irrelevant or secondarily, secondary. What was meant by idolatry by the prophets of the Old Testament is to worship things rather than God who is alive. And that's why the prophet says you worship idols, they have ears and they do not hear, and they have mouths and they do not speak. They are dead. And if man worships things, he transforms his, himself into a thing and he becomes dead. 
uh, man becomes a prisoner of that which he creates and there is no more significant and tragic symbol of alienation modern times than nuclear weapons. Here are weapons which we have created. Here is the use of nuclear energy which is perhaps the most the greatest expression of the capacity of human intellect and human reason. And yet we in, here in the United States and the people in in the Soviet bloc, we and the whole human race is ruled today by these nuclear weapons. Nobody wants war and yet we don't know how to get rid of them. We have created them and yet they dominate our lives and we just try frantically to uh, see that we are not eventually destroyed by the domination of the very work of our hands. <clears throat> These three factors, the consu homo consumens, the homo technicus, and the alienated man, I think are the most significant dangerous elements in the man which we see in, which develops in the affluent society. And of course we know that many of these needs have been and are being created artificially by the industry which needs to sell its boredom preventing goods by the means of advertising. Our appetite is constantly whetted. We are constantly brainwashed to consume more. When it happens somewhere else, we call it brainwashed. When we call it here, when it happens here, we call it uh, well adjusted or benefiting from the, uh, uh, go from the f from, uh, advertising and so on. But it doesn't really matter. We are manipulating our tastes. Tastes and needs are developed which are artificial tastes, which are not genuine human needs, but which are artificially created human needs. Now, if I say this, you will ask, well, but what is the difference? Can one have a criterion for that which is a genuine need or that which is an artificial and really synthetic need, synthetic need. Or can one, is there any criterion to differentiate between, if, we, if you permit me the single, s uh, simple language, between good needs and bad needs? Do we not have to say something I want? Well, if it doesn't harm anyone else, that is fine if I can get it. But nobody could question that what I want and the need I have is a good thing. You find many young people today at the age of 16, their main wish is a, a motor scooter or if they are, uh, have richer parents, a, a, a sports car. And if you would tell them that this need is really something which they shouldn't have, they look at you uh, in the very best case uh, implying uh, just to all to understand it. Now you might say to your young son in that case, one motor scooter, one sports car, why not two, why not three? Where do you fin? Why do you set the limits here? Well then he might get thoughtful rather than if you tell him that's bad. Well, so I'm not speaking pedagogically here uh, because I want to make a point clear, uh, namely to raise a question have we any way of distinguishing between good and bad needs? Well, strangely enough, uh, we do that with regard to certain things. Uh, we are all agreed that drug addiction, alcoholism, or even overeating is not a legitimate need. We all say, yes, you like that, but it's not good for you. And we all agreed on it. That's not good for you. And in fact, we would forbid um, advertising of uh, drugs. We would uh, frown upon, perhaps, advertising of uh, overeating. But so we advertise how you can eat without getting fat. Uh, but at any rate, these examples show there is a certain agreement that there are some needs which are really harmful, in spite of the fact that the person who wants to take drugs is as convinced as anybody can be convinced of God that that's what he wants. Uh, 
that this is something which is his desire and he feels kind of, uh, he feels it's a great injustice. If somebody says, yes, you want this, still it's bad, and we don't acknowledge your wish and your need as uh, an appropriate one. Now, my question simply is, can we apply this to more things? Can we study in general what needs in an affluent society are good, serve men, and which needs are bad? Now, then you will ask, of course, so what do I mean by good and bad? Well, that would be a topic of several lectures, but I shall say it in a very simple form. I would call good all and needs which serve, which are good, all that which enhances aliveness, sensitivity, responsiveness to life and to nature and to man, and interest in life. Now, interest is a word which is, uh, has been rather abused. I use it in a sense which corresponds to its original Latin meaning, namely interesse, to be in it, rather than to be caught in your own ego, rather than be caught in trying to defend yourself against the world, being open to the world. And I would say a bad need is all that weakens sensitivity, aliveness, interest, responsiveness. Well, certainly one could argue in many ways whether a need falls into the one or the other categories. But that argument is the case with almost everything. Uh, nevertheless, I think as a criterion, we arrive at some concrete point of view. What do we consider good or what do we consider bad? I would say many of us might agree that the comics in the Western movies and all movies which show brutality and sadism and all pictures are bad much worse than, than pornography, uh, uh, although nobody seems to mind particularly, because we have our certain traditional values of what do you think is bad and haven't yet adjusted to the new bad things which are much worse than the old bad things. <coughs> um, altogether, I would say and that's all I can say in this connection. I think the man, we in the affluent society, should seriously at least consider and think about the question that we may create things for reasons of profit of those industries which create them, which are harmful to man, and that is not only drugs, and that's not only liquor, e even though that is uh, freely advertised. And that, therefore, our affluence tends to make men more passive, more receptive, more empty, less productive, uh, or as uh, it has been written, has been said, the production of too many useful things results in the creation of too many useless people. Well, that's actually a quote from Karl Marx although you would expect it is a quote from a religious writer, provided you don't know Karl Marx, or you believe what the Russians say about him. Now I come to the uh, other problem which I want to deal with, and that is that this modern consumer, the gadget man, the alienated man, seems to have lost in all this consuming a sense which existed in most societies, and that is the sense for the question, what is the meaning of life? What are my values? What, who am I? That is to say, questions which have been raised by religion or which have been raised by philosophy. We consume today, so we are not bothered. Now, actually, uh, I should like to say that if we visualize complete automation, or let me put it this way rather first, in the past, men worked 16 hours, 18 hours, uh, he got up early in the morning and in the evening was so tired, there was not much time and occasion to think about these spiritual and religious questions. Well, today we only work eight hours, 
but our boredom preventing industry fills out the four hours which are free so we are tired too when we go to bed and don't have a chance to think or to be concerned with the question what is the meaning of life what is the aim of life what are the values which I follow I do believe that when automation will be accomplished will be a fact we are just beginning that then indeed the religious question or the spiritual question will really become paramount because then people will have either consumed so madly that they become mad or they will be forced to consider what is all this for? What do I live for? What is a human being? And what is that which is a human being should be striving for? Now, of course, you might say, uh, so here speaks a preacher who uh, will now introduce uh, a chapter on admonishing you to return to religion. Well, I am not uh, only not a preacher, I am a person who does not believe in God, so I will not try to admonish you to return to God. But I would like to say that the question whether you formulate your beliefs in terms of God or not is really quite secondary. And in this I am in agreement with quite a few theologians, whether it's Teilhard de Chardin or a number of the European Jesuit priests, who would agree that while the concept and the concept of God is after all a thought concept is important, there is another dimension which transcends the thought concept and that is the dimension of the reality of the human core of a person. You might say there are believers in God who are utterly unreligious and there are unbelievers in God who are religious. Or you might put it this way, somebody can believe in God and not do God's will and somebody may not believe in God and try to do God's will as defined in terms of loving his neighbor, being humble, and doing justice. That's an operational definition of doing God's will in, in the Christian or in the sense of the prophetic Jewish religion. <clears throat> now then, I'm concerned with the question that there are many people today, especially perhaps young people, who for one reason or another cannot accept the the theistic, traditional, organizational frame of reference of religion and who do not even have words to express what you might call a religious or spiritual or truly humanistic concern. And I should like to say a few words here about what I consider to be the nature of a religious attitude regardless of whether it is or it is not expressed in terms of God. I should like to remind you of the simple fact that we have one of the greatest and most profound religions and that is Buddhism which is a religion without God and that we have some of the great mystics of the greatest mystics like Master Eckhart who uh, finds a formula of differentiating between the Godhead who is the nothing and the God with a small g who to whom for whom he has no great use uh, and he just died early enough well he didn't die so young but before the trial against him was finished and he was sentenced for her heresy now I should like to say the first quality which is common to a truly religious or spiritual attitude is that of faith. Now if you hear the word faith you think right away of religion again. But there is another faith uh, and that is the faith uh, that has nothing to do with God and yet is essentially as a human experience not different. The f uh, perhaps I might say I do not believe in original sin but I do believe in original faith. And by that I simply mean the faith with which every child is born. As the 22nd Psalm says, 
you let me have faith in the breasts of my mother. A child has faith, an infant has faith in the breasts of his mother. It has faith that the mother will nurse him when he is thirsty and cover him when he, is, when he feels cold. The child has still faith that people mean what they say. Now we are all accustomed, being older, that people lie. We are not surprised, some are more and some are less surprised, that people lie even in your face. And that they not only lie with words, but they lie with your face, with their faces. You can lie with your eyes, you can lie with your upper part of your face, it's a little more difficult to lie with a mouth than with a chin. Uh, <clears throat> that's why it's better usually to watch the mouth and the chin rather than to watch the eyes. Uh, now for a child, this is a shattering discovery. Who would have thought of such a thing that a person says something and doesn't mean it? That father uh, smiles and is very friendly to the lady who has come to visit and when she has left she said, what an awful born or worse things. And the child is confronted with a new discovery which shatters its original faith, namely that people mean what they say. Uh, well, you might, it is very worthwhile to study what is the history of anybody's faith, how his faith is shattered, and how it is either reconstructed or how it remains shattered, and then you have the complete cynic. In fact, more than the cynic, the person whose faith has harmed, whose uh, uh, who has been so harmed by being deceived in his faith that he begins to hate life because life has eluded him, because there is nothing in which he can have faith, and that is an awful situation to live in. You can't sp speak of faith in men, which simply means you are convinced that a certain person whom you know will not do certain things under any circumstances. For instance, harming another person for the sake of his own material advantage. You cannot say that of everybody. Many people would do it. And you can say of a lot of people, I don't know how I would react. But I find that those people are most unhappy who feel you cannot know it of anybody, who feel everybody might react in such a way you never know. To have faith in a person means precisely to be certain of him in spite of the fact that you cannot prove it. But you are certain of him because you know him. You have seen him. Well, I might remind you that all love is based on faith. Or rather, that our failure in love to a large extent is precisely because of lack of faith. Uh, so I was speaking about faith in this sense of a conviction based on an inner experience of something which is not provable at the moment or may never be provable is one part of what I call a spiritual attitude. Another part is simply to develop one's capacity for love and for reason. And another part is, and that is, transcends the purely ethical or what's called ethical and reaches into what you might truly call religious, or if you please, mystical, correctly speaking, although this word is usually completely misunderstood, namely, the capacity to drop your ego, your selfishness, the narrow confines of this thing, your body, your memory, your position, which you think is indestructible, which you want to hold on to, which you want to... Uh, increase in size and uh, therefore you are filled with your ego and closed to the world and are not open to the world. Therefore you are rich but you are really poor. You are powerful but you are powerless. Uh, now this concept of being completely open to the world is an old concept which you find in the prophets, you find it in the early, in the uh, in the Gospels, you find it in all mystics, Buddhist and Christian and Jewish. Uh, to us, to the modern consumer, this sounds a peculiar thing because he does precisely the opposite. He tries to make his ego strong 
uh, so that he is a powerful man, has a great position, has at least a car which looks like the car of a powerful man, um, fills himself up with things all the time, and doesn't know what it means to be strong precisely because he is open and lets the world enter into himself, receive it, and therefore being related to the world. And eventually it is part of what I call the spiritual attitude to take all these things as the most important things in life. I think the trouble with most people is that they have no priorities or they're confused about priorities. Uh, on Sunday they think this and on Monday they think something else. Real vitality and energy is produced by one thing, namely to be concentrated on that which is most important. There's a beautiful book by Kierkegaard with the title of which is Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing. Now most of us don't will one thing, but many different things. And a person might even be more vital if he has really decided to will evil, completely and exclusively, rather than the person who is constantly undecided whether he wants the good or whether he wants the evil, because his energy is just worn out by the inner conflict. Now what I'm saying here is simply <coughs> that uh, it is part, an essential part of this attitude which I described here to be aware what I want, to choose my values and in the spiritual attitude this would be to, to choose the, uh, the values of integrity, of love, of faith, of reason, of courage. Now, there's one more thing implied in this. If you want to do this, you have to become suspicious of words. Everybody can say anything. Nothing easier than to talk about uh, virtue or God. Words are nothing but sounds unless they refer to reality, and this reality is only shown in the actions of a person, in his total personality. This reality is rooted in the very core of his personality. Perhaps I could illustrate it with an old, old Jewish story where a man is asked why he visits the rabbinical master, and he's asked, do you do it in order to hear his words of wisdom? And he says, oh no. I want to see how he ties his shoelaces. Well, in tying his shoelaces, a man shows probably more of himself than he may show by words. There's a lot of talk these days about God and God being on our coins and what not. And the question is, you never come to grips with the reality of spiritual experience, of what I call here the core of a spiritual attitude, unless you do not become suspicious of words. Unless you don't know what the Zen Buddhist calls, that after all, a word is only the finger that points to the moon, and not a moon. And if you are concerned with a finger, you will never even see the moon. And today, I think one of the great dangers, of the most important dangers, <coughs> is that people are prone to take words for realities. And that's why they are impressed by words. Children are much better at that. Primitive peoples are much better at that, simply because they don't know yet so many words. Uh, but we, and education contributes this too, we take words terribly seriously. We take thought concepts so seriously. And the whole point is that if we do that, we miss the realities. And the reality of a man is not contained in his words, not even in his concept, but also only by studying what is the relationship of his concept to that which we can see in him as an inner reality. Try and practice. Sure, you see some people where you know he looks insincere, he is insincere. You can't prove it. He hasn't committed any crime, and yet you can see from his face that he's insincere. But uh, that we see only in the most uh, 
in the crudest cases. You can develop your practice, your experience in this, by watching, and then you will watch more the mouth than what comes out of the mouth. And words and concepts are the least reliable source of information about the reality of what another person means. Um, well, uh, to sum up what I've tried to say is, I think we are confronted with an alternative which is either to go on with empty consumption, gadgets, alienation, and God knows what will happen to us. I think we'll become so frightened and anxious that out of sheer fright we might then end up in nuclear war, if not for other reasons. Or what we do is then what some people do, simply deny, simply deny the fact that we are the materialistic consumer by pointing out the Russians or who ever else are, they are the godless people, they are the materialistic people. That is one frequent way of not coming to grips to the fact that we are godless, that we are materialistic, that spiritual values have really no traction, no weight as motivating factors except with a very few. Uh, I believe that our problem is that we either go on this way and then affluence will have been a curse or we go on in another way and that is try not to trust words but to go back to the true experience of what our humanistic tradition is and to a human reality. I think also we have to make certain economic changes to stop that influence of consumption which uh, manipulates us today, but there's no time to talk about that. Certainly there is no way by going back. If a mother said, has a 13-year-old boy, and this boy sh shows all sorts of problems, and she would say, oh Lord, if he were only three again, then he wouldn't have these problems. Well, if she could have her will, he would be psychotic. Uh, and the same holds true of society. We can't go back. That is uh, simply a pipe dream. But I think we can go look at our society and see we need uh, the kind of production we have today. We need a centralized production. And the question is, can we have centralized industrial production which does not lead to materialism, which does not lead to complete extinction of individualism. To put it more concretely, can one, for instance, produce cars without the executives wearing the same suit and having all the same opinion? Or is it necessary, is this degree of conformism necessary to produce a good car or to produce good shoes? I don't believe it is necessary. I think it is possible to keep our method of production and at the same time to revitalize that which is the essence of our world, of our tradition, and that is the values of humanism which I have tried to talk about. In other words, that our task is, and the only task, and I'm ending here, which shall save us from the destruction of boredom or the destruction by the atomic bomb, is to make this industrial society a society fit for life fit for men, and that means fit for the greater aliveness and growth of men. And what we have to do is to have some faith in men and to have some imagination of possibilities which exist rather than to be so geared to the past alternatives that we don't see any new ones. If we have that imagination, if we can recognize some of the dangers which have arisen, I believe that we ought to be capable of remedying these dangers and then indeed I think we could enter a new age and a better age. Thank you.